the Hive actors encrypt new victims around the world on a daily basis. Yep. Busy little bees. (laughs) (laughs) Keeping that hive moving and growing. You're listening to the Help Me With HIPAA podcast, where HIPAA and humor collide to make learning fun. Your delightful hosts are Donna Grindle and David Sims. Relax. HIPAA help is on the way. Welcome to episode 393 of the Help Me With HIPAA podcast. My name is David Sims of HIPAA for MSPs, and joining me is Donna Grindle of Carden. Good afternoon, Donna. Good afternoon, David. How are you feeling with your Barry White thing going on? Ah, feeling a bit under the weather. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've been battling COVID for the last few days. The so. Rona. Yeah, my Corona. <laughs> it's funny when that first came out, everybody was scared to drink the alcohol. I never understood that. <laughs> you and I spent a lot of time going, we we don't understand <laughs> what's going on. I remember going to a bar. I was like, can I get a Corona? I mean, the beer. <laughs> <laughs> And they did. They told me that the bartender was like, dude, we've had like, nobody's ordering these right now. I'm like, what in the world? <laughs> well, and it's not still not looking up from there either, buddy. <laughs> yeah. But I, I got it last week, probably from a family member. And, um, mm-hmm. and I've been quarantined to the upstairs portion of my home, which the first few days was pretty cool. <laughs> I have to admit <laughs> Uh, going into, I don't know now, five days in, I'm like, uh, <laughs> yeah. but you know, you, you have a complete environment made just for you then. Yeah. Yeah. But I got other stuff I need to get done that aren't inside the house and it's driving me crazy. Well, you're getting close. You're yeah, getting close. I'm getting close. So. You're sitting up now and talking to me. Yeah. Instead of looking as pitiful as you did the first day. I don't, I don't honestly feel bad. I sound bad and I'm kind of foggy and I have these little coughing spells and all that. But compared to what some people have told me, mine has it's been, it's been mild for pretty much the whole time. It's been like a cold, I guess would be what I would say it's like for me. My sister had it not long ago and she was saying that she had to crawl like army man crawl to the bathroom. <laughs> Oh, bless her heart. <laughs> I was like, no, it, is not, it ain't got nowhere near that bad for me. Mm. So It just depends on which one you got and how your immune system is at that moment. It's crazy. Yep. So uh, we're going to power through the podcast either way because the show must go on. Power through. Yeah. Awesome. So uh, Powering through so that you can get to the Privacy and Security Boot Camp? Heck yeah. Because that's coming up March 12th through the 15th. Looking yeah. forward to it. Yeah, this comes out like I think February tenth. You need to go stop what you're doing right now if you want to make the um, early bird price because it it goes up sometime soon. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I always get in trouble because I don't know all those things off the top of my head. But go get that approval and uh, check out priceactbootcamp dot <laughs> Yeah, got to be careful with how I use my voice today. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, so go check it out, though, because all the information is there, how you register to attend, the fact that we have 27.6 massive live CCB continuing education units. There's going to be tons and tons of immersive training. It's going to be good. We're going to focus on supply chain risk management, documentation, training programs, policies and procedures, Identifying and managing your risk. I mean, just all kinds of cool stuff. So if we don't see you there. If it can go wrong at will, we're going to go down that path. Yep. Going to be lots of good stuff. So this is definitely one of the ones you don't want to miss. We can't even call it a conference because it ain't. It's like the unconference. Oh, there we go. (laughs) Anyway. Check us out. Prosecbootcamp.com. That's right. All righty. I want to let everybody know. If you want to find out what Donna and I both do as a living, you can go check out Donna at CardenHQ.com. You can find me at HIPAAForMSPs.com. That's where we make our day jobs happen. <laughs> we try to anyway. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I know that blows your mind that we're not making millions on the podcast, but we do have other jobs. <laughs> the big goose egg. 
I know. <laughs> That's why we offer the double your money back guarantee. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'll do my best. Here it is, the HIPAA Say What COVID version. It's time for a HIPAA Say What. <laughs> that was a good one. I like that. All right, so we had a listener question come in for you, Donna. This is from yes. Mary, and yes. Mary writes, love your podcast, especially David. <laughs> I'm working- she did not say that. Okay, I added that part. Okay. Yeah. I am working on an audit of data within the environment for HIPAA data. I noticed that this company in PA has the FMLA forms for employees in a secure, but not HIPAA secure drive. I am in a discussion with HR. I believe this contains HIPAA data and needs to be at the top of security level and logging turned on for access. Thoughts? <laughs> it <Question> depends. <laughs> <laughs> All right, moving right along. <laughs> uh, it's a so there are some scenarios where HR may have to worry about HIPAA, but it only applies if you're in a very specific self insured environment so that your claims and, and healthcare information is actually running through there. But Unless that's the scenario, then HR is only holding information about employees, which does not fall under HIPAA, unless <laughs> <laughs> it gets complicated when you are a medical facility and you're treating the individuals that work there, so you have both their healthcare information, which is falling under HIPAA, and their employment information, which is not falling under HIPAA. And then on the FMLA form, you've got something that comes out of their medical records. But here's the thing. Once it's on the FMLA form and turned over as an employee, well, now you, you're kind of outside HIPAA. You're HIPAA adjacent, maybe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it does get really, really tricky in those scenarios. But if you just are the average employer – then no, it wouldn't apply. And only in a very specific situation would it apply to HR. Like, for example, if HR got an FMLA form and it was an employee who was also a patient of the organization, they couldn't then go look at the medical records to confirm or ask questions about what was on the FMLA form. They would have to go back through to the individual, just like anybody else. No hopping over and crossing that line. Yeah. This is one of those areas that trips people up often because not all health information is protected health information. And that same health information can move around in different ways. And sometimes it's protected and sometimes it's not, even though it's the exact mm -hmm. same data. Yeah. And so when you're same element. It, yeah. When you're looking at it from a data perspective, you're like, okay, either it is or it isn't, but it's not about the data necessarily. It's about the data in conjunction with how it originates or who has it and those types of things. Mm -hmm. So that's what makes it a little bit complicated. That's why a lot of people will see something that's health related and immediately jump to, oh, that's a HIPAA violation. Well, no, not necessarily. <laughs> no. Not at all. Most of the time you hear everybody being super uh, certain that they know about it. We just looked at some of those that they just go off the rails pretty quickly. And note to self, HIPAA is not an international law. We just <laughs> saw that argument somewhere. <laughs> but I, I can tell you that there is a challenge in some organizations to draw that line. And just as Mary's scenario, there's so many variables that I would still need to know to know exactly where the line's drawn that I don't, I don't, it's a fact specific determination, David. Mm -hmm. And I do not have the facts that yep. I need. Now, I will say though that in this instance here, that if you have the ability, you being your client, if they have the ability to make something more secure, and it is that type of data, whether it's under HIPAA or not, then do it. <laughs> you know, yeah. 
Well, so, and you know that people PII, which is what FMLA would fall under, unless it's one of those tricky scenarios where it's HIPAA. But that falls under PII of the employee. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you're going to probably fall under some type of <laughs> legislation or something somewhere, whether it falls under HIPAA or not. Yeah, I don't know about the state laws in Pennsylvania about protecting employee data or, you know, all of those other things. But you're right. I mean, we tell folks when we're doing our assessment, we give them the option to say, hey, how about you consider including more than PHI in all of these policies and procedures? Things like, oh, I don't know, your HR information, your accounting information, your proprietary, your secret sauce. Mm -hmm. So it is a good idea to do that. And the in the organization where there are a lot of complexities and, and you might have to divide clearly, here's the line where HIPAA stuff lives and here's where non-HIPAA stuff lives. But for the most part, we encourage you to say who has authority to see these things and that's who should see them and how they should be treated regardless of what it is. But you're right. I mean, the same piece of data, you know, the date of birth is PHI when it's attached to some other identifiable thing about my health care. My date of birth by itself is not PHI. Mm -hmm. But you got to connect me if I, you know, you got to connect it to something else. Yeah. But I can take your your name and your date of birth that you that you gave to your doctor that's PHI. I take your same name and same date of birth and to the car repair place you took your car <laughs> and it's not PHI. Exactly. You know, so even if they ask for your medical history at the car place, <laughs> it's not PHI. <laughs> so, you know, you can't say, yeah. I mean, I certainly wouldn't give them that information, but you can't say, oh, that, that violates HIPAA. I can't tell you that. No, it doesn't violate HIPAA. No. But anyway. Yes, it's always we, fun <laughs> when we when we hear the the wide variety of experts who have I spent fifteen years working in blah right away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when you come out with your credentials in the first sentence, I'm already like, yeah, <laughs> I don't know about this. Yeah, yeah, okay, I'll, and you just listen and you be like, yeah, but you're wrong. But so you're, there's, you're intelligently wrong. <laughs> <laughs> as long as it's not. Yeah, bah, 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 bah. yeah. So there you go, Mary. Hopefully that helps to answer your question somewhat <laughs> mm. and uh, tell you what to do from there. Yes, All right. Indeed. Now we're going to jump into the topic for the day, which is going inside the hive. Yes. Isn't it? That's I cool. Know. We'll talk about the Hive takedown. So for those of you who don't know, that is a ransomware variant and a ransomware gang, which I think is one of the coolest names. <laughs> yeah. Just Hive? Yeah, just, I don't know. For some reason, when I'm reading through this, like the headline, FBI covertly infiltrates the Hive network. <laughs> you know, it's like something you hear off a Marvel movie. <laughs> <laughs> True that. Yeah, so it was, it was very cool. Of course, a lot of, you know, a lot of jokes can be made about it. Like, you know, I have these visions of hackers sitting around, you know, with the little honey bottles sitting beside on their desk. And <laughs> nah, you know, I see the actual hive of activity with all of the bees running around. Yeah. I wonder you know, instead of cubicles, if they had the little octagonal things <laughs> they sit in. The cone, the honeycomb. Yeah. They had a honeycomb of cubicles instead of the squares. Yeah. That's one what of I'll my favorite doing. cereals growing up. Anyway. <laughs> I know. It's one of the few you can eat without milk. <laughs> Don't ask me how I know. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's stories that go with that stuff, too, like Cheerios and beer. But anyway, the the what we want to get, you know, the, what the big attention-grabbing thing is that the Justice Department was able to come out and say, we... Not only did we, you know, grab all their stuff, but we had infiltrated their network since July of 2022. 
and did the official takedown in January of 2023. Mm -hmm. And the uh, covertly infiltrated Hive Network thwarting over $130 million in ransom demands. Yeah, which understanding what they mean by thwarting is where the the fun part comes in because (laughs) you could imagine what's going on inside the Hive Network when they're like, what the crap, man? Why why are these people not paying? (laughs) (laughs) Why is our income down? (laughs) Yeah, what's going on? So they, they penetrated the networks. They finally got into where the decryption keys were. And then they were like going behind and, and they were working with German and the Netherlands and I mean, several other countries because these things, they're worldwide. They don't just operate here. But I love the fact that it was like as soon as uh, somebody would get become a victim, then they would pull that key and then go search for that victim and give them the key and tell them not to pay the ransom. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's brilliant and and they is. had to have been doing it in a really clandestine way because it didn't get out so i wonder if they ever knew they had a mole in the hive <laughs> yeah well the hackers got hacked so this is where you always say that hacker isn't always bad you know true very true you, you have the ethical hackers the ones that are trying to make us safer and then you have you know, there's the white hat, black hat, ethical, and I don't know what the antithesis of ethical is, but criminal. Yeah. Well, yeah. the good part is they do have different color hats on, so you can tell which one you're dealing with. Yeah. Yeah. It's like Mad Libs. <laughs> and, uh, Except for the gray hats. <laughs> spy versus spy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but they were in these networks and operating in – Secrecy well enough that they were able to identify their infrastructure and shut it down. So they stopped 300 victims from paying what was demanded of $130 million. Wow. And then after they got everything, they gave keys out to like a thousand previous victims. So it is a great takedown, a big score for law enforcement going against these folks. But everybody always asks, well, why don't they just shut them down? Well, if you want to know how hard it is, (laughs) (laughs) what's really cool. Now you can go read the details that are in the press release and we have a link to it, but you know what I'm going to (laughs) do. They gave me a link to the legal filings and the affidavit. That's where the good stuff is. I know. Juicy details. So I did run the calculation and $130 million divided over 300 victims would be on average $433,333.33. So yeah, just under half a million dollars would be the average across all those. Yeah. What they're supposed to, what they were going to need to pay to yeah. start the negotiations. Right. Yep. Yeah, and, and I think 130 million is probably low because I think this is what you're kind of you're kind of hitting on, which is it doesn't always stop at the first payment you make, <laughs> right? Because <laughs> they did clearly document that they were double extortion. Yeah, you paid to get the keys, and you paid for them to not release the data because they're honest criminals. Of course they are. Yeah, it's always the thing that gets me. Uh, But the unsealed documents that include the affidavit and the search warrant and the details and what they found and all these other things, it's like 24 pages. And, uh, you know, you're putting up with it, reading through, skimming for the parts because, you know, there's a lot of legalese. And then all of a sudden around page 11, some good starts, you know, stuff starts coming in, things that they know that we, you know, weren't necessarily completely aware of. So they had a few statements like, first, they had to define the hive, you know, because these are, hey, I'm explaining why we believe there's criminal activity here, why we're targeting them, and why we think that where we're wanting to search is indeed the place we should be searching and the people we should be arresting. So their example, as they're leading in, explaining what we know about 
the Hive Gang. For example, on or about August 14th, 2021, on or about, it's right around August 14th, 2021, <laughs> Hive actors used the ransomware to encrypt the computers owned by a hospital located in the Midwestern United States. The hospital had to resort to analog methods for treating existing patients and, for example, maintaining paper copies of patient charts and was unable to accept new patients immediately following the attack. We've talked about this, patient safety. Mm -hmm. The hospital was only able to recover its critical data after paying a ransom to decrypt the data. So it gets back to people wanting them to report when they pay so they can use this information to track down the criminals. Mm -hmm. So there's a hospital. So we know healthcare is involved. They, we even had alerts about this reviewing that they do target healthcare. They had like 1,500 victims since they started in 2021. So we're looking at a, a pretty substantial operation. And it's pointed at things that uh, we, our wheelhouse, healthcare, and then a technology company in New Jersey, quote unquote. Hmm. It's all this a technology company. This was May 2022. A technology company in Jersey was encrypted with Hive ransomware. Okay, great. But then you read this. Because the company owns servers used by many of their customers, the victim's customers whose data was stolen were also harmed by the ransomware event. Hmm. The initial victim, meaning the technology company, along with one of the other affected entities, and then it says a private U.S. company located in the Central District of California quote, paid a significant ransom. Hmm. Mm-hmm. So their most recent victim in the Central District of California was encrypted on or about December 30th. So very, very active. So they were making it clear that uh, they were they knew what they were doing. We are aware we got we got the goods. And then I love that they also confirmed just how much these folks have been doing. The Hive actors encrypt new victims around the world on a daily basis. Yep. Busy little bees. <laughs> <laughs> Keeping that hive moving and growing. <laughs> in its first year of operation, they received over $100 million in ransom payments. Since Why don't they, they get a real job, Donna? Why don't they get a real job? I know, really? Because... It's ridiculous to make that kind of money, you know, and and what's going to happen to them? The, the thing that they've done here is, at least so far, is shut down the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So it's like they cut the supply lines, if you will. But when you get down in there, now there is a whole section. And if you are someone who truly wants to understand a little bit more about this, but not in a super technical way. There's a explanation of how Tor infrastructure works. It, it it talks about the difference in the IP address and what they use on Onion and Onion routers. And so if you really want to understand that, it's in this document. Go there, start around page 11. It's some great information. But what's important is the number of servers that they had operational managing this service this ransomware as a service and they had five servers because they kept everything streamlined and separated david because they <laughs> have to worry about security too you know yeah yeah <laughs> they often have better it than the victims do i know they had they are secure and they have redundancy but you could see that they have it's sad but their victim server they called it the sales department, <laughs> where victims go to pay their ransoms. No, I'm not selling. I'm not buying. <laughs> it's, it doesn't count, but that's what they called it. Uh, the victim panel sales department. 
<laughs> and then affiliate panel for their partners in crime so that mm-hmm. you're, you could log in and get your stuff. And then you have the main administrator where they're running everything and managing the malware and all that kind of stuff. And then you have the public leak site. So using their own leak site and leaking the data when you don't pay. They had a pretty sophisticated operation. As David said, when he saw the screenshot of the affiliate dashboard that they included, and they have an 80-20 revenue share until you get to a certain level, and I think you make a little bit more then. Not that you should be in that level. <laughs> but it's it's uh, the way the dashboard is structured, it looks really nice. Yeah. And it doesn't look like they're doing crime. It's like upcoming offers, paid offers, mm-hmm. paid companies, encrypted companies, disclosed companies. And you have your list of companies, and then you can request your payouts. Yeah. Looks good. I like it. Yeah. I mean, I would think it's a, you know, great tool if I'm an affiliate. I would love to see that, but I'm not an affiliate of a criminal organization. (laughs) That you know of. (laughs) I am doing too many things with you. So... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I mean, it's, it's just the downstream of the downstream you have to worry about. I know, right? <laughs> they they seized all the servers, and they even found that they had leased servers to build their network with a United States hosting provider out of Los Angeles data center. They hmm. had two servers sitting there and one running a virtual private server. So two dedicated servers, and then a VPS probably was the link site. And then there were two dedicated servers in the Netherlands as well. Turns out the two in L.A. and the two in the Netherlands were redundant. Well, it's called geo-redundancy. Yes, they had redundancy in place to improve performance for their customers. (laughs) The sales department was working with. You know, the customer experience when they call for support and having that speed is very important. <laughs> yeah. I want to make sure they can pay quickly. Oh, yeah. Never stand between somebody and their money. <laughs> <laughs> That's always uh, what you tell us. So it, they were taking the same approach. And when they seized all of this, and they just did it in, in, in January, when they did this, because th- that six months that they were – undercover, lurking around in there. They said that sometimes they were even able to find the victims and get them the decryption key within hours. Hmm. But, you know, you got to find the victims and figure out who it is, and then you call them up and go, hey, I know you got hit with ransomware. No, we didn't. Yeah. Who no, about? we didn't. I don't know what you're talking about. Bye. Well, this is another reason why reporting is so important, because, you know, for people that they can come back to later on and say, you know, you're on this list. And we were able to get the encryption key, even though it's months later. That's important for them to know. So that'll help you out. Well, and there's, you know, folks that can't get everything decrypted. And sometimes you just say, well, we're going to have to live without that thing. Mm -hmm. Well, now you could get it. So it's really good. And they, they managed to get the victim database. So they were able to then, every time it would encrypt, it would create a new key and store it in the database of their victims. So those people who think, oh, I got hit once, I'm good to go. Now they know you'll pay. Mm -hmm. You get to move up into the good customer list. (laughs) (laughs) Premium sales department attention. Yeah. it's like VIP. It's like any other marketing program. You buy something one time, you're on their list (laughs) forever. You can't get off their list. (laughs) Yeah. But they, they were able to get, the good thing was they got their communications Between uh, one another, which hopefully might lead them to the individuals, they got the malware file hashes, which means that they could then track the malware changes and see the potential coding behind it. And to me, this was the best part. They got the information on 250 affiliates. Oh, wow. So you got all the victim information and how it operated. You got the databases, but you got the affiliates too. Mm. Now we can try to go. Now, granted, again, they're all anonymous and running on the Tor 
program, but at least now that gives them more information to track people and individuals with. There's at least 250 people out there that have changed their underwear today. (laughs) (laughs) Or at least when the raid took place. (laughs) Yeah. When this, when this was made public, they're like, Oh crap. (laughs) Oh crap. There's crap. But, and everybody's like, how did they get in? Did we know about it? Okay. CISA had sent out previous alerts on Hive Mm -hmm. and even said that they're getting in a number of different methods, single factor, remote desktop protocol. Please do not have that exposed to the public uh, internet. Just don't. And it don't even have it internally. Uh, Okay. Uh, Virtual private networks that have bugs in them, uh, vulnerabilities, and other remote network connection protocols exploiting the Forta token vulnerability. That's the Fortinet firewall vulnerability. And sending phishing emails with malicious attachments. So every way that we've talked about they could be coming out of you, they are. It's not like they pick one because the affiliates are the ones that get in Mm -hmm. and drop the malware. And then everything that happens from that point forward is handled by Hive, and uh, at least not now. And their amazing <laughs> customer service. Yes, and their amazing <laughs> customer service. <laughs> but we, I mean, we got HHS is HC three the uh, healthcare cybersecurity alerts published one back in October twenty twenty one. So you know they they knew it was new. They knew it was after our healthcare. Mm-hmm. We've also gotten an alert today that one of the Russian hacktivist groups is aiming at healthcare and that somebody somewhere found a list of attack victims that were all in healthcare Hmm. or they're like planning to attack. So who knows? So the good news is they captured a lot of information. They were able to shut these folks down. Bad news is... They clearly have redundancy. They have disaster recovery, business continuity plans, just like we do. We hope we do. Mm -hmm. So what do you think? Will they be out of production for long? Nope. Unfortunately, they won't. No, it's it's a good start. It shuts them down, and then maybe they can track with what they've learned because they're not, you know, they're not saying everything they know. Mm hmm. No. But if nothing else, it, it slows them down, and uh, and they learn a lot in the process. Not the criminals, but law enforcement. They learn a lot. So it'll be interesting, as always, to see where it goes from here. You know, yeah, I think I think I can't remember. They uh, uh, often discuss, you know, oh, they used to be called Conti, and it's the same people, but now they're called this. You know. They'll just come up with some new thing that's not Hive anymore, and then when they start looking at the indicators of compromise, they'll start to see, oh, wait a minute, that looks like them, so now they've renamed themselves. Yep. But it's unfortunate. The good news is this was huge to be able to be in and monitor them for that amount of time and allowing them to protect the people while they found their way through the infrastructure to be able to shut it down. Now that's kudos to the FBI and the special agents uh, and folks out of the Tampa field office, apparently is managing this. So good for you. Mm-hmm. Uh, you are spot on, but I know you just got to keep going because they're not stopping. No. Ever. Job is never done. It's like I had somebody is a, client they were talking to me last week and i said how do you keep up with all this and i'm like it's nearly impossible to keep up with all of this you have to you know very carefully pick and choose what it is you you want to follow then you gotta like for you and i we have to distill it down to then give it to our clients even our team and so there's Mm -hmm. just a lot of filtering there are probably people above us that filter we filter (laughs) (laughs) it's you know but it is just it's and I, I told the guys, like, I probably spend half of my time every day just trying to figure out what to filter down to my team and what to filter down to my clients. It's a lot of information. Oh, definitely one of those moments where you sit there and you're like, how am I going to explain this? 
Mm-hmm. So that was the good thing about this, the detail in this affidavit, because it does have it written for those who want to learn about it. But I'm not going to try to take them through uh, explaining how Tor and Onion works. Yeah. No, but this is one of the benefits of joining the Cardin Club or HIPAA MSPs is we take all this information that we get inundated with day in and day out, and we do distill it, distill it down for you as a member, and then you don't have to do all that work that we're doing. You can take yeah. it and give it right to your clients or to your team, and it cuts a ton of time and work off of you to do that. Yeah, because sometimes the stuff comes out, and it's like, eh, yeah, I'm not passing that on, but when we got these... There was another alert that came out the end of last week reminding about the use of remote management and monitoring software uh, used by criminals for attacks and reminding MSPs and IT companies that use it to uh, get involved. That we put out there along with some other information about it. We put this out there. So we do try to provide that single source of information because of you know, we're already doing it anyway, so we just plug it in out there. And if you're in the club or HIPAA for MSPs, you can log in and you get our alerts of, hey, pay attention to this and go ask somebody else or forward it to somebody else. Yeah. Yep. You don't have to ask, well, I wonder if this applies to me or not. If it's there, it applies to you. Yeah. <laughs> and as if that wasn't crazy enough, Amazon decided to release a household robot that follows you around the house and... <laughs> <laughs> records everything it sees and does even has like a little telescoping thing like r2d2 that comes out the top so he can see on your counters and stuff it's i like, know you i david <laughs> saw this he must have been laying in covid fog and sees this because all i get is price that will be impossible <laughs> yeah like we have no chance yeah. i mean we we can't even get people to use the alexa devices securely and now we've got this one following us around <laughs> <laughs> and yeah deciding when it's going to listen and watch a little yeah. thing peeping over the edge of the counter <laughs> yeah so you can there are all kind of crazy stuff you can do with it i mean it, it's really cool from a technology standpoint you know i'm all uh, i'm all geeking out over it price tag's not terrible it's not something i'm gonna buy yeah. but um yeah, it's just a lot lot of stuff happening. So privacy and security, not going away. It's going to get harder. It's going to get more important. So see you at the Price 8 Boot Camp. Yeah, bring it. <laughs> All right, folks, that's our show for today. Thanks for listening. Please share us out. And we will see you again next week. And remember, HIPAA is not about compliance. It's about patient care. You've been listening to the Help Me With HIPAA podcast, hosted by Donna Grendel and David Sims. The show created to help you with HIPAA. For more information or to ask us a question, visit our website at helpmewithhipaa.com. Neither Donna Grendel or David Sims are attorneys, and they do not offer binding legal advice concerning regulatory compliance. The information in this podcast should not be relied upon or construed as legal advice in any way. Consult your attorney for legal advice concerning compliance with HIPAA regulations.